I'll just pin this on you. Do you want some water? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, lovely, fulsome introduction. I'll come back to Oslo any time you invite me with those <laughs> kind words. Um, actually, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, to give the, the, the lecture today and to be part of the events over the weekend as well. I think uh, the university and the film house should really and truly be commended for this marriage of the narrative about the changes and images of resistance that are emerging from the contemporary Middle East with the actual visual images to embed that forward through the amazing films that have been chosen to be shown over the, over the weekend. So, so thank you very much in, in, indeed because um, I'm going to enjoy the films um, very much. I feel very inadequate surrounded by these amazing directors and people who are in touch with sort of documentary making and I was feeling really very inadequate after dinner last night, sort of racking my brains, thinking, oh my goodness. But I remembered, I have actually made a documentary. <laughs> I made a documentary for the BBC um, 11 years ago, actually, on the history of Iraq, which I wrote and presented for the BBC. And uh, s certain small claims to prophecy um, at the time, just, just before the, the, the war. So I feel good about that, that anyway. Um, I don't have Mahmoud's excuse that uh, this is not something that I do frequently. Um, so um, you can hold me up to a, a high standard um, and I'll, I'll try my best to, uh, to, to, to reach those standards. Um, my, my talk today, is, as the title suggests, is going to reflect on Islamism in, as part of the Arab Spring and in the wake of the Arab Spring. And within that, to um, spend a little bit of time, although not the whole of my talk this morning, uh, reflecting on violent Islamism specifically. The, the first thing I want to say before I go in, into any detail of, of my talk is, is that, of course, we all need to remember that Islamism is but one part of a multiplicity of factors which account for um, the, the phenomenon of the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening or the rebellions and revolts, the transitions, the challenges, uh, the disruptions and the dislocations that are taking place in the region, have taken place in the region since December 2010 and are still ongoing. Um, I think perhaps we have, again, a tendency to think that this is an event that has happened. Um, I think that we should try and avoid being seduced by that and remember that actually this is a series of events and these are a series of events and challenges and changes at uh, dynamics that are still to take hold and unfold truly with, with, within, within the region. So I'm, I'm looking at one dimension of what's taking place. And the second point I want to make is, is that I'm only, <laughs> even within Islamism, I'm not talking about one single Islamism. So within the explanation of a multiplicity of factors, I don't think we can talk about a single Islamism in accounting for the Arab Spring. What we've seen, in fact, is that Islamism is manifest in a variety of forms, and to degrees of power and popularity right across the region. Um, and, and, and even the ripples are being felt elsewhere. The ripples are being felt elsewhere across the Muslim world or within Muslim communities outside of the Muslim world. But what I do want to say, and what of course I will concentrate on, is, is this dimension about, or this dimension of violent Islamism within this multiplicity. So I'm going to try and cover that, um, cover that by unfolding an analysis with, the sort of, with, with four themes. I want to assign Islam its place. I want to talk about violent Islamism. Um, and in particular, I'll talk about Al-Qaeda and the jihadi Salafis. I want to talk about the transition that's taking place, and finally reflect on some, some, um, some trajectories that I believe are taking place within, within the region. 
So I think I've already made it clear that it's actually quite difficult to assign Islam its, its place. To do so is difficult and complex and not really as simple as some of the commentators and pundits would have European audiences in particular believe. And this is because of the complex, dynamic, sometimes proactive, but mostly reactive role played by a variety of Muslim and Islamist actors. And they usually reside within the Islamist spectrum, but they're not all within the Islamist spectrum. Indeed, the Islamist spectrum is, is changing itself and is being, being challenged. It's frittering away at its, at its edges. Of course, my main point is, is that first and foremost, we need to remember that Islam was actually, and Islamism was actually relatively absent from the Arab Spring. And this, of course, provided somewhat of a surprise for those who'd long described, and particularly since 9-11, the Arab world as actually being in the grip of the Islamists, completely in the grip of the Islamists. Hence, the banner of Islam was but one of many that was raised and that protesters rallied to. For, for example, in, in Yemen, in Change Square, what we saw when thousands set up their tents to mobilize for change, to remove the president, what we witnessed was the representation of a truly diverse spectrum of Yemeni society and not, despite the predictions of analysts in the post 9-11 era, not the Islamists. So, I mean, I, I've just sort of captured some of these images of resistance from Change Square um, in, in, in Sana. Certainly the members of the Deaf Dumb Youth Revolution Alliance, the members of the Actors Tent and the Diplomat tent were not calling for an Islamist theocracy or an Islamist state to replace the regime. Here in Sana'a, as in other locations across the Arab world, Islamism in its varieties was compelled to reside, not even necessarily compete, but to reside among a plurality of interests and groupings that today represent Yemeni, Tunisian, Egyptian, Jordanian, Lebanese, Syrian, Arab society. Islamists, of course, had their part in the unfolding events, but they were not center stage. Indeed, the call for democracy, constitutional rule, the echoes historically, as Mahmoud was pointing out to us, and multi-party elections, heard in the demands of Arab protesters in the past and in the present day remains remarkably dissimilar from the violence-based radical jihadist agendas commonly associated by the West in the post 9-11 era. On the other hand, these demands for democracy, for constitutional rule, for multi-party elections have not meant the wholesale rejection of Islamist discourses in favor of a region-wide embrace of secularism and Western democracy templates. And this again is why we are looking at a very complex and myriad phenomenon. Hence, Islamism has become one part of a multi-dimensional constituency emerging to demand and agitate for change. And in fact, I was asked, I don't know if Ulrika is here, but I was asked yesterday by Ulrika if you know, we've moved from the, from the Arab Spring to the Islamist winter. It's, it's much too early to declare that. It's much too early to declare as others have, that Islam post-revolt or post-revolution is taking center stage. It's, it's still even much too early to, 
to, to call that to call that one. Because what's happening is that the current generation, uh, and we can call them a youth generation, but I think that would be unfair to other more elderly members of society that have played their part in the in the rebellions that, are t that, that have taken place and are taking place. But this new generation is expressing discourses and narratives of resistance and change around more equalizing notions of power, democracy, and citizenship. And what's happening is that Islamists who want power are having to be more responsive to those demands. And again, the challenge for them is the reaction one, the responsive one. And they have yet to proactively take control of that agenda. They're having to play a part in it, and mostly reactively and responsively. And there is this obligation placed upon them, even as power holders, that if they're not going to give people what they want in terms of the debate and the emerging discourse over power and how it unfolds in these societies, they will be brought to account. They will be brought to account. Thus, the Arab Spring and the Islamist input has also demonstrated an iteration of the plurality within Islamism. No single Islamist group can claim a monopoly. This is a plurality within a plurality that is compelled to recognize the challenge of other discourses within the spectrum of Islamism, as well as the possibility or compulsion to alliance formation with political and social elements outside it. I think it can be epitomized by post-revolution Tunisia, where the Islamists elected to power have been compelled into alliance, legislative alliance. It's a test. But the price for electoral victory is working in coalition with centre-left secularists. This also is a reminder that the Arab Spring for Islamists is in fact no triumph for the utopian and long-held political vision promoted by Islamists that Islam is the solution. It can only really be part of the solution and a negotiated part of the solution at that. This has also been a form of Islamism tied to demands for democracy. And as we see, even in transition states, such as in Tunisia, the, even the Islamist demand for Sharia states is dissipated or even disappearing as a result of the transitions that are unfolding and taking place. Still, I must address the elephant in the room and the issue that preoccupies the West and continues to preoccupy the West and in particular Western governments. Um, in Northern Ireland in June we will actually be hosting the G8 summit um, and one of the items on the agenda for the G8 summit remains and still is the jihadi threat and the Western preoccupation with it. So what's happened in terms of violent Islamism and specifically Al-Qaeda? Now, as we know, there is scepticism amongst some Western opinion that even if Islamists have not led the Arab Spring, they will take control and bring with it their jihadi violence-based ideologies. So, as I've explained, in part, the current multifaceted manifestation of Islamism is confounding expectation. Not least of all because the jihadi threat represented by al-Qaeda and its networks in the region 
appear to be marginal to what's happening. Of course, in the wake of 9-11, Western governments were united in identifying al-Qaeda and the violent global jihadi movement as one of the most significant threats of the modern age. And particularly with the Middle East, as the locus of much of al-Qaeda's influence, effect and power. In this way, Islamism, epitomised by al-Qaeda, was represented in far wider ways and in a sense explains the reason why when the Arab Spring occurred, it wasn't, it was largely unpredicted by the West and in foreign policy departments. That wasn't the prism through which they viewed the region. Al-Qaeda's threat re-established, as we know, in the post-9-11 era, the precedent for invasion and war, as well as security crises in most of the regimes across the Middle East. And yet, when revolt and revolution came in the Arab world, it was not led by Al-Qaeda. Their leaders have not mobilized the popular masses or led the rebel elements that have challenged regimes across the area. Only in Syria, where the popular uprising of 2011 has, by 2013, turned and been transformed into an armed rebellion and grinding civil war with increasingly sectarian overtones, have Al-Qaeda emerged alongside other rebel fighters. And I would suggest that maybe what might even happen in Syria is what happened in Iraq, in the iteration of, of, of violence, sectarian, and then a, a final rejection of that when, when change is achieved. So while the objective of reform, reform and regime change may have been one that was widely shared by people in many states of the Middle East as part of the Arab Spring. The, the jihadists, with their violent means for change, have in fact largely been rejected. In its representative form, Islamism has played a non-violent, not terrorist part in the Arab Spring. And I think this demonstrates that Al-Qaeda have failed to accommodate itself to the new realities, created as much by their fellow Islamists, who of course they reject and criticize and declare un-Islamic, to these new reali realities created as much by their fellow Islamists as any other incumbent regime or emergent social and political forces in the region. It is as if over the last decade that Al-Qaeda, ideologically tied as it has been to the greater jihad, the far jihad against the US and Israel, had simply overlooked and failed to understand the pressures, misery and constraint of millions of Arabs that millions of Arabs have had to live under since 9-11. Yet in so many ways, I would argue that the currently rebellious populace of the region is the one that has paid the price for Al-Qaeda's fanatic rendering of Islam. It should be noted that I think that this is a most important and yet overlooked dimension of the Arab Spring. And that is that the region's jihadi groups have actually created a disconnection over the last decade with the very constituency it claimed to represent. The Arab Spring demonstrates this. The impact of jihadi violence and terrorism in the region, perpetrated by Al-Qaeda, only added to conditions of domestic tyranny and militarization and security crisis and entrenched authoritarianism, that most of the citizens of the region have in fact been forced to endure. This was particularly true 
in the post 9-11 era when the state in the Middle East employed counter-terrorism and security measures as a means of blanket suppression, repression and oppression, denying rights and freedoms which subsequently motivated millions to mobilize in the rebellions that have characterized the Arab Spring. Of course, there are other factors which account for this seismic change in the region. But the point here, and the point that I'm trying to make, is that jihadi violence against the citizens of the region over the last dec decade created the excuse for the employment of hegemonic power utilized by the state to again target such citizens and deny them their rights. What we see now in terms of being effectively responsive to the Arab Spring is that the jihadi elements are out of step. It will only be when the transition fails, when states become fragile, again, or if the transition is neglected and loses momentum, that the jihadi elements will be, a, will be prepared or able to exploit the situation for their own goals. Furthermore, as Arab, as Arab rebellion and protest ensues as part of the Arab Spring, what we actually saw was initial silence from the jihadi ideologues. They, like many others, were surprised by the Arab Spring. Contrary to expectation, the vanguard of the revolution in the Arab world or rebellion in the, in, in the Arab world have not been the radical, bearded mujahids who for decades promised to bring down these apostate and jahili regimes. But in fact, it's been other people, ordinary people, the ordinary people of the states of the region who have no common cause with such ideologies. In other words, the Arab Spring is as much a rejection of Mubarak, of Ben Ali, of Bashir al-Assad and of al-Qaeda by the peoples of the region. Attempts to claim the revolts in the name of al-Qaeda have in fact largely run aground. They have failed even after the revolution, after revolts, after rebellions, to claim these events in their name. Nevertheless, the leadership of al-Qaeda and various offshoots hasn't stopped them from trying to claim these events retrospectively, to shape them, to view them through their own ideological prism, to argue that it is yet another link in the chain of jihad against America and the toppling of local regimes. They thus, the ideologues, Zawahiri and Badawi, claim successful results as part of the same jihadist aims. And of course, they continue to critique the other Islam, the Islam that has become part of the transition that's taking place in states such as Tunisia and Egypt and Libya and Yemen. In sum, Al-Qaeda have failed to make the Arab Spring into their own Islamist project. The transition appears to move ahead while ideologically they are lagging behind. So what does this tell us about the politics of transition that is taking place within the region and is yet to take place within the region and the place of Islam within it. Well, as I said at the start of my talk, we now know that 
perhaps one most startling manifestation of the events has been that since the outbreak of the Arab Spring in Tunisia in December 2010, how little it has had to do initially with political Islam and the preoccupations of the West with the Islamist threat in the years since 9-11. Nevertheless, Islamists are playing an important part in some dimensions of the politics of transition. They are, as we know, proving to be electoral victors. And of course, such outcomes have caused disquiet in Western capitals. Yet, of course, we might say the success of political parties formed by the Muslim Brotherhood in Tunisia and in Egypt, for example, is explicable for reasons which have little to do, again, with radical jihadi agendas and more to do with the politics of opposition and the resonance of their long-standing social conservatism. And again, I think this is very much an element that is absent from the accounting of political Islam in, um, in, in the post-Arab Spring world. The resonance of the socially conservative Muslim national pitching of groups like the Muslim Brotherhood. Hence, Islamism in the transition is a reflection, again, of a process of identity reformation that touches on symbols which are centuries old, but lay in broader processes of Islamic resurgence, apparent not just in the latter decades of the 20th century, as much contemporary scholarship ascribes, but perhaps in the second decade of the 21st century. What we are perhaps seeing again is a new resurgence, a new reformation of Islamist identity. If we can agree that this process is taking place, I think we could argue, as Bassam Tibi has done in the past, that such identities are acculturated and are very much more so acculturated in the second decade of the 21st century than they were in the, in the late 60s and the early 1970s when the first wave of, of Islamist and Islamic resurgence was identified. This is an acculturated Islamism which has been formed in the, sec in the secularized context not only of post-independent states but in the ferment of change and protest and demonstration and rebellion across the Arab world. And in the narratives around that that are still ongo ongoing everywhere across the region. Even if there's not an Arab Spring taking place in the Palestinian camps of the Gaza Strip, it doesn't mean that the politics of the Arab Spring are not contributing to a narrative of change. It's framing the discourse, it's framing the conversation. Whether the conversation is about electricity or the weather or the price of fuel, it's framing the conversation. This means that the trajectory of, oh, I didn't mean to do that. This means that, the, now, now I've really lost my brownie points. I thought I was doing quite well. <laughs> Um, this means that the trajectory of, of transitions, of course, are different across the Middle East. We can't throw the spotlight on Egypt and use it to explain the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the, the region. And of course, with that, with acknowledging that difference in the trajectories, so too is the trajectory of Islamism. So by acknowledging that, we have to reject the argument that has been resurrected, that the events of the Arab Spring are going to be like the revolution in Iran in 1979, and that we're going to see the tidal wave of one iteration of Islamism 
sweep across the region. That simply won't be the case. That simply won't be the case. Transition and revolution is apparent in North Africa. Yet all we can talk about are some superficial similarities between the outcomes in Islamist terms between Tunisia and Egypt and Libya. Elsewhere in the region, in the Levantine states, including Lebanon, Syria and Jordan, the Arab Spring and the role of Islamists has yet to even be fully realised, accounted for and understood. But it will be there, it will be there in the shaping of new political, new political dispensations. Even if it doesn't result in the overthrow of tyranny, it will be there in the shaping of new political dispensations. In the Gulf states, the portent of, of an Arab Spring or popular mobilization is certainly not lost on the region's rulers, nor to those who regard the area of critical importance to global energy supplies. The role of Islamists in the majority of Gulf states has been severely curtailed in terms of the dynamics of opposition politics and responses based on the kinds of demands for freedom and democracy and end to corruption, political and economic reform that has echoed elsewhere in the region. But those demands haven't gone away. They've merely been pushed down. But they haven't gone away. And they will come back up again in the negotiation of new kinds of political dispensations. Hence, there is much that has been exposed by the people's revolt across the Middle East. And it, of course, exposes and challenges Islamism too in these transitions and trajectories. As I said earlier, for decades, Islamists have promised that Islam is the solution and that their agendas could help tackle the major social, economic and political grievances of the people of the region. They promised also that their struggle had a transcendent quality that could unite the Muslim Ummah in jihad to obtain their objectives, whether it was for an Islamic state in Egypt or the end of Israel's occupation in Palestine. As such promises, of course, have remained largely untested. And whilst it is still too early to judge whether Islamists will monopolize the transitional governance projects currently taking place, to date, they haven't been able to provide all of the solutions. And they're coming to grips with the reality of power. And they are being successfully challenged when they begin to take the wrong steps or appear to be unresponsive to their populations. We saw this in November last year with President Morsi when he attempted to strip the judiciary of certain powers. We saw it in the vehement popular protests that quickly led him to cancel it. The transition heralded by the Arab Spring demands much of the Islamists. It proves that Islam is not the solution. It can only be part of the solution. The transition will, of course, by necessity, be a long and complicated affair. The effects will not only be domestic, but they clearly have a strategic region-wide and international implications. And again, this is a challenge for the Islamists. Many have been worried by the apparent regional rise in the wake of the Arab Spring of the Muslim Brotherhood movement. But nation-state boundaries are still intact. 
There's no articulation or revival of a pan-Islamist project. In fact, what we are seeing, again, is a manifestation of the very ordinary politics, very ordinary politics and diplomatic maneuverings of a number of nation states. The transcendent quality is not apparent and is not manifest, and in fact is beyond the capacity, it may not be beyond the ambition of the Muslim Brotherhood. Of course, any political organization will have grand, lofty ambitions and ideals. But in terms of capacity, I think we must, we must question and challenge the assumptions that the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood is yet again a death knell for the region and demonstrates the extent to which, as, much, as part of much of Western discourse, would allow us to believe the grip of the Islamists. I think, by way of conclusion, I want to come back to the title of my talk, where I asked whether violent Islamism in the Arab Spring. I hope by now we can see that Islamists are presented by as many challenges as opportunities as a result of the Arab Spring. The place of violent Islamism, contrary to prediction, discourse and expectation, has not been assured in unfolding events. And in some respects has indeed been made very, very, very marginal. Conversely, it is not violent Islamism that has proved to be best placed, but non-violent Islamism that has proved to be best placed to capitalize, to mobilize on the unfolding transitions and opportunities for power. But even the ambition of those Islamists best placed to actualize those ambitions will not necessarily result in, mon in a monopoly because of the internal challenges within the Islamist spectrum and as opposition movements, opposition politics, multi-party politics, the development of more constitution-like systems of politics and cultures grow in the transition, their place again is not assured as a monopoly. Islamists will be challenged to share power. They'll be challenged to share power. And Islamists remain faced with challenges to be responsive to these new dispensations. I think this is best ep epitomized by an incident that took place last year in the Egyptian legislature. The newly elected speaker of the Egyptian parliament, who himself had languished in Mubarak's prisons and was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, actually rebuked a fellow parliamentarian who, who was a Salafi, who had, during the session, begun performing the call to prayer. We are Muslims. We are all Muslims, said the speaker. But if you want to pray, there is a mosque in Parliament, but Parliament is not a mosque. Hence, Islamism, of course, has its place in the transformations wrought by the Arab Spring, but not in terms of total domination or a theocratic rendering of the temporal realm of politics. Many Islamists in the Arab Spring, like conservative Christian Democrat counterparts close to and on our shores here in Northern Ireland, are discovering the paradox of the place that in practice they must occupy in the political realm if their voice is to be represented. This is a place of compromise, but one that holds hope for democratic transition in the wake of the Arab Spring. Thank you.